Another thing about radioactive decay is that it's exponential. It follows what we call an exponential curve. You th might think that something exponential means it has to rise really fast, but uh, an exponential curve can also go down. So that's what's going to happen here. So I'm going to show you um, an example here, uh, maybe a nice giant graph here that we can make it really, really clear what's going on. So I'll just try to make this super clear. So on the x-axis, we're going to graph time. Now the time could be in seconds, it could be in hours, it could be in days, it could be in years. In uh, physics, uh, SL or HL, we tend to have just about anything possible here. But what goes on the y-axis, it's either the number of particles, but it could also just be the mass. Okay, so we could be saying the number of particles, we could be saying it's the mass, which could be in kilograms, it could be in grams. So sometimes we look at these types of things here. Now, uh, what if we take a look at this and say, okay, well, at some, at some time t equals zero here, we're going to say then that there's uh, maybe 100 particles or 100 grams of this material. This, this doesn't really matter. Okay, but we have, we'll have 100. So what ends up happening then is that the number of particles that there are, if it undergoes decay, so we're, we're assuming this thing is radioactive, which means it gives off particles. So this uh, then, if you look at the shape of this over time, it's actually going to go like this. So it's going to be something that goes really, really, really close to zero particles or zero mass, but never quite reaches it. We say it's, uh, you know, this is an asymptote. It never quite reaches it. But at some point in time then, there's going to be exactly half of the number of particles there originally were. So if that's the case, then I can make a little dotted line over here. Take a little dotted line. This is a special time. We actually call this t one half. That's an important thing here. Now we say that t one half is called the half life. Okay, that's going to be defined then as the amount of time it takes to get from you know, 100% of, of its mass or the number of particles down to half. So that's why we call it half-life, because it's the time to get half of what you had before. Now, of course, this happens again and again, which means if we go to... Now, I don't know if I've drawn it right, because uh, I just tried to estimate what this curve looks like. If I did it right... That's close enough, actually. When we get 25 grams, let's say, of this material here, then this right here is going to be the time. That's after two times of going down by a half. So in that case, this is two times t one half. Now, this has a lot of big implications, right? Um, maybe you want to take a look at what is the half-life of some sort of nasty thing that uh, is, is really kicking off lots and lots of, of uh, products. So like... Um, I know plutonium or uh, uh, even uranium and things like this. Uh, those are things that are radioactive for a very long time, which means they have a very long half-life. That means it takes you know, millions or even billions of years just to go to half the number of particles there were, which means those things, it's very difficult to get rid of them. So once you have those nuclear things, let's say uh, you know, byproducts from a nuclear reactor, which is a great way to get energy, but you have these really nasty byproducts sometimes. So those byproducts, uh, sometimes they just try to bury them under the ocean, uh, believe it or not, uh, or at the bottom of the ocean at least. Uh, or they bury them in a big deep hole, and they cover it with a bunch of lead and just sort of hope for the best. Because it's going to be really nasty and radioactive for millions or billions of years. So radioactivity can be something sort of bad, but it can also be something good. So for example, um, let's say you need to have a scan, so maybe you have a trouble with your um, upper digestive tract. That could be. So what they would do then is have you drink uh, some sort of shake. Normally it'll be like, um, I think it'll be some sort of uh, thing that's radioactive. So maybe it's like barium or something. They'll have you drink something with a short half-life but is radioactive. Then what you do is when you swallow that, um, that stuff then when they try to take an x-ray or a CT scan as it's called, that's computerized tomography, uh, when they try to take a scan then of your uh, upper digestive tract, then maybe they can actually see it. Uh, because, you know, if not, the scan, it just goes right through your stomach, uh, you know, material, your intestines and things. 
So if you want to see what's going on in your intestines without having to open you up, they'll have you drink something that's going to serve as a contrast agent, so something radioactive, and then you'll drink that. You'll be slightly radioactive, which means then um, this stuff, these um, like the x-rays or the computerized tomography will sort of bounce off your intestines and then give you an image. So they use something with a very short half-life because you don't want that in your body for lots of uh, time. So sometimes the half-life is like an hour or even you know 30 minutes or something. So that's actually something pretty important. Now um, don't be too scared by radioactivity. I mean, I don't know if you knew this, but um, you're actually radioactive. I mean, right now you're radioactive. If I had a Geiger counter, you know, a little machine that can count either alpha or beta or even gamma, um, what you would do is, you'd, if you just pointed it toward yourself, every once in a while you'd have a little blip. Be like, blip. Because you're radioactive. Not much. But you're made of some particles that are radioactive, like uh, you have potassium-40 in you and that's uh, radioactive. You have, uh, what is it, sodium-22. So there are some radioactive things in you, so don't be panicked. Radioactivity doesn't have to be bad. Um, what's actually really fun, what I used to do is um, I would actually eat a banana and then, um, and then look at the radioactivity from that. And it turns out that a banana is high in potassium and you actually then get a certain percentage of potassium. It's potassium-40, which is a radioactive kind. So what I would do is I would first take the Geiger counter, put it in front of my stomach and before I eat the banana and get an idea of what the background, in other words, what my body's naturally doing, also what the sort of outside is doing. And I have it pointed there. Then I would eat a banana. And after a little while, you'd actually see some extra uh, potassium-40 spikes. So that's really neat because when you eat something like that, like, oh my God, I'm radioactive. Does that mean you shouldn't eat bananas? Not at all. There's lots of things that are mildly radioactive. You're radioactive. So don't worry, don't panic. You just don't want something that's uh, super, super active uh, that's giving out really lots and lots of things here. So the half-life is something that's actually quite important because that's, remember, that's the time it takes for uh, the mass or the number of particles to go down by half. So that means, you know, you might ask, you know, how long does it take to get to uh, one-eighth of the amount of material you had? Well, then you just have to think, how many times have I gone down by half? Well, one half is, well, 0.5. Then another half, that's 1 over 4. And then another half after that, that could be, you know, um, 1 over 8. So that's, you know, then you've gone through three half-lives or something like that. So that's, um, that's sort of how to think about half-life. Now, remember, I also told you that these right here are actually called the uh, parent because this is the, this is the thing that's undergoing decay. In other words, it's starting off with this, this element. Maybe this is, I don't know, potassium-40, let's say. If this we're counting the amount of uh, grams of potassium-40, well, then it's sort of kicking off particles and becoming, you know, there's less potassium-40 because it's making other things. And there's less and less and less potassium-40. But if you think of it that way, that means that as you get less potassium-40, you get more of whatever you're making. So sometimes you can also think about the graph of what the daughter looks like. So whatever particle that we're making here, in this case right here, we can actually say then that the daughter actually does something like this. In other words, it does the opposite, right? If there's lots and lots, if there's 100% of this stuff, then there's no daughters. If there's 50% of these, then there's probably 50% daughters. And as you get less and less of these, there's more and more daughters. Notice the daughters shouldn't actually reach 100. Right? They should get really, really close to 100, just like this gets really, really close to zero. So that's a way of looking at this as well, saying that how the parent is related to the daughter. Again, I don't know why, but there's no sons. There's just daughters. So that is uh, exponential decay. Another important thing is that it's a random process. So that means you can't, you can't know exactly when it's going to happen. You can look at the probability of it happening, but you never know exactly when it's going to happen. Um, one example of how to make something or a curve look exponential, you could actually have a whole bunch of dice. I used to do this again with my students. Uh, we would do, you know, we would have like a pile of like a hundred dice, you know, a big giant, you know, thing. We'd, we'd shake them all up and we'd pour them out. And we just had a rule. We said, okay, anytime you see a six, let's say, then you take those dice out of the pile. So if you graphed then the number of dice, let's say I had a hundred dice to start with, it would look like this. 
And it turns out after a number of uh, different, so instead of time here, I could have, you know, number of rolls. And it turns out the number of rolls versus, you know, um, this right here, the number of dice, is going to do the same kind of curve here. It's also going to be exponential. Which means, you know, maybe I have 100 dice and after another one, maybe I lose some, I lose some. I can't know exactly which dice are going to do it. I just know that the probability is there of this stuff happening. So that's uh, a little bit about exponential decay. So hopefully that helps to clear things up.